All right, well, thank you for being here. Um, my name is Greg Rand. Company is called Renters Warehouse. We wanted to put this together to just invite some folks in from around the community to talk about our favorite subject. People that know me know uh, that I have no hobbies. All I care about is business and real estate investing. And uh, we kind of recently opened up this branch in Charlotte and we're growing it. And so we're just doing this, okay? Having events and bringing people together to talk about taking positions in the American housing market in great cities and great towns all across the country, all right? So uh, just quick setup on that, just to tell you who, who I am and why, if you think my advice is good, you can rely on it and what our company does. So Renters Warehouse is the biggest property management company in America that manages single family rental houses. So we don't do buildings, we don't do apartment buildings, we don't do malls, we don't do shopping centers and office buildings. Single family rental homes is our whole world. And we've got 25,000 of them across the country that we manage for mostly small investors, some very big investors who basically, they wanna put their money into single family rentals. We handle finding a tenant for them, renting them out, collecting the rents, doing all the, the, the maintenance and the repairs, uh, doing the accounting, sending them the checks. And so they're able to be as close to a passive investor in the real estate market as you can get by letting us handle everything, all right? Now, about six months ago, Renters Warehouse bought my company. I founded a company 10 years ago called Own America. And Own America, we got music on? Let's kick in. Can we, yeah, let's kill that. Thank you. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so my company, Own America, was an online platform that investors used to buy and sell collections of rental houses. All right, so our clients were big Wall Street firms and a lot of mid-sized professional investors. Hey, Rosie. Um, people that had between like 50 and like 50,000 rental houses, those were clients of ours. And we built this online platform that we provided them uh, data, analytics, consulting, and then field services to help them accumulate rental houses all over the country. So Renters Warehouse, here's actually a little diagram of how this all came together. Probably can't read this that well, but property management company with the rent collection and tenants and I'm sure he'll find the volume knob sometime soon to kill the music. Is that bothering you guys? Can you hear it? Okay. Is me talking about bothering you? <laughs> so property management company upon which uh, they bought this investment portal and they were building a real estate company in between. And so our mission at Renters Warehouse now is to be the first national real estate brand for single family investors where you can do all the research and all the analytics and access millions of properties for sale. You can figure out which ones you like with the help of consultants who are in our branch offices across the country who can help you acquire the property and then sell property if you want. And all that goes into property management after the fact. So our goal is to help people do um, probably the most foolproof plan for long-term wealth creation, which is accumulate assets, real estate assets that are income producing in good places across the country. Okay, that's all we do. So um, that is Renters Warehouse and what I, oh, so this is my favorite little graphic. So we've got a property management company upon which we built a real estate company and an investment company and we're just bringing them all together into one vertically integrated service that is designed to make really investing in the real estate market easy. Because it's not easy right now, it's hard. A lot of moving parts, we're trying to bring them all together under one roof and make it simple. So philosophically, um, we're gonna over the next 45 minutes kind of cover three things. First, uh, we're gonna bounce around the country and I'm gonna show you different markets around America and how they perform. And it's gonna bring us all the way back to Charlotte. All right, so you get some context about how Charlotte works compared to like Denver and Houston and other places. Uh, all the places I'm gonna show you are good real estate markets for one reason or another. Okay, they're not all great for every investor, but they're all great for certain reasons, for certain kinds of investors. And that's one of the, I'm walking you through a process in an accelerated form that we've been doing with these big Wall Street firms for years, which is they've got a billion dollars, they want to deploy it into housing across America, and they're asking us, where should we go? Okay, where are the best places to invest? Where is the demand the strongest? And the cool part about it is there's an enormous amount of analytics and data that we built for them that now we give away to you. All right, we, we literally have built all the tools that we have for these big Wall Street clients and then repackaged them and spun them all around to small investors because the biggest part of the market is small investors and that's kind of where our heart is also. All right, dealing with Wall Street guys and gals is cool, but dealing with everyday people who are actually doing this for their own personal financial legacy and everything else, that's, that's better, that's cooler. So 
Um, we view the single family home as the instrument through which you buy America. Okay, sounds fluffy and philosophical and patriotic, but it's actually factually true. All right, you're getting a deed to that part of the country. Um, well, the philosophy begins with something that I think everybody here, whether you're experienced or not, has probably heard your whole life. What is the first rule of real estate? Somebody shouted out. Location, 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 right, yeah. The funny thing is, is that if you were to watch Bravo TV or Home and Garden TV, you'd think that finding a great deal, like instead of location, 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 a lot of the noise around real estate investing, a lot of the seminars that are out there, a lot of the coaches that are out there, most of the TV shows that are out there are about deals, deals, deals. So they're not as concerned about where you're buying something as what you're buying. How can I find a property I can get for a steal? None of today is about that and none of what we do is about that. I couldn't find you a steal. In fact, if I found a, if I found a house for half price, what do you think I would do? Buy I'd buy it myself, right? So um, that's not our promise. Our promise is it's all about quality, all about taking positions in places that are on the rise, all right? And what's neat about that is that it's super common sense. There's all this great data and analytics I'm gonna show you, but it begins with this idea of like, where are people moving and why, right? What are the population trends, the migration patterns, the employment data? What is, where are people going like a glacier slowly and like unstoppably to a new place? People who are there are staying, people who are elsewhere are coming there. Why is that happening? Is that likely to continue happening? And can you place your bets there and make money? Because more population equals more demand for houses. More demand for houses means upward pressure on the value of the houses and upward pressure on the rents, which means you make more money on income and you make more money in terms of wealth creation over time. Right? So we have a wide array of folks in here from people who are beginning, people who are experts, but you, the experts know what I'm saying is true, but it's, I, hopefully it's nice to hear it in a very common sense way because the world seems to be coming around now to realizing that Buying houses and flipping them can be fun, but accumulating a high quality portfolio over your lifetime is the way to be able to stop working someday or only work because you want to because you have enough coming in that like your kids and grandkids are taking care of. And that's what our mission is, right? So what I want to start with, this is my favorite chart of all time. This is a 50 year chart of the price of a home, average price of a home in this country. And I want to show you this because when we do what we do, we run up, across, run up against a lot of conventional wisdom that is the opposite of right. All right, one of the things I hear all the time is, well, you know, what goes up must come down in real estate. One time that happens. All right, I hear a lot of people, a lot of smart people. I've heard people with lots of real estate background, investment bankers, people who seem to have the credentials to know what they're talking about, and yet they say, and all the heads nod, oh yeah, what goes up must come down. The housing market is like this. But that would be the stock market, right, John? Stock market sitting into this. My financial planner's in the room here, and so he's, uh, I'm gonna tease him a couple of times probably tonight. Stock market's a great place to put some of your money, and real estate's a great place to put the rest of it. But this is a 50-year chart, and I wanna show you this because you're going to see stories in the, whatever you read, newspaper, probably not, digital media, whatever you see this weekend, if they talk about housing, the odds are they're gonna talk about the impending calamity or the housing bubble that we're in the middle of now again or some kind of negative spun news and usually the underpinning uh, belief system is well oh you know of course the market is cyclical the economy is cyclical but the housing market tends to go up no matter what's happening in the economy so here was like I know people this is 1980 when interest rates were 18 19 percent I know people in the real estate business my mom is one of them we don't argue about this anymore because I'm not gonna convince her. She talks about the crash of 1981. The crash was her real estate company. Real estate companies crashed in 1981 because nobody was buying any houses. But here's what happened with home values. This is home values over 50 years. So you've got wartime, peacetime, Democrats, Republicans, high rates, low rates, good economy, bad economy, booms, recessions on this chart. And all you ever see when the economy goes soft is a flattening of home values, except for this one time where we had a bubble, true, and then we had a correction. But isn't it interesting how this 50 year chart kind of chugged along and as soon as it deviated, it fought its way back and corrected. And now it appears to be a little bit too high for my taste and look what's already starting to happen. Knock down, level. 
If the economy turned negative, if jobs got bad, okay, if unemployment went up, if inflation went up, if the overall economy went bad, I could see this being flat for a while. But the only reason why it came down was because back about 10, 12 years ago, the banks lost their heads, the government lost their heads, and they were giving money away to people. This is the way it looked on the ground that caused this. Everyday people that could afford 200,000 had a blank check in their pocket for 300,000, and they went bidding. And they drove the prices up artificially because the bank gave them a, a qualification for more than they really could qualify for. That simple fact, people can debate what caused those policy problems, but you can't debate that that's actually what happens. That's why the prices artificially rose. And then what was so cool about the housing market, it wasn't a pretty thing, but it's nice looking back historically now and realizing that you can't deviate from the trend line, otherwise we're all gonna get mauled, right? The market does not like being messed with. It wants to do this, and so when it did that, it did that, and it went back to doing that again. All right, so first order of business is to just get, internalize the idea that number one, the reason why this is, is because population growth equals housing demand equals upward pressure on prices, period, right? So you could have, like I have people who will argue with me about how, well, you know, the price, the price of tea in China, we've got tariff problems, we've got all these things that are surface issues that are all real, but they don't change the fact that if population is growing, period, that's it, housing is gonna have upward pressure, all right? So that's why we tend to fend off negativity, all right? And if you read negativity in the media, chances are they came up with their conclusion before they wrote the story, and for whatever reason, they like, they like telling negative stories about housing, so learn this stuff for yourself, and don't believe what you read. Don't even believe what I say, just look at these charts and see if they speak to you, all right? And then use the data. All right, so now we're gonna bounce around. This is now a shorter version this is no longer 50 years, this is now 20, all right? The blue line is the tail end of that chart I just showed you. And this is Charlotte. The, uh, the green line is Mecklenburg County, and the black line is North Carolina. What I'm gonna do is bounce around the country, and by virtue of looking at any real estate market, any city in the country, through the lens of how it performed over the last 20 years, you can get a picture of how the market dealt with the stress test of the last 20 years. Right, stress test. Like guys get to a certain age, they put you on a treadmill and they make you run as hard as you can to see how your heart's gonna work, right? That's what happened to the housing market over the last 10, 20 years. So we had a boom, we had a correction, and we had a recovery in most markets, but how does it actually look? So what you can draw as an inclusion on Mecklenburg County is that when the rest of the country took off, it didn't take off quite as steeply, right? Bigger party, not quite as big of a party. Bigger hangover, not as big of a hangover right, in Mecklenburg. But then Mecklenburg has been fighting its way back and actually it now has surpassed the curve of appreciation over the rest of the country. Okay, does that make sense? So let's bounce around a little bit. So this strikes me as a fairly resilient market that is not fooled that much by the goings on nationally, that all of a sudden is now in the recovery really catching steam. And we believe the reason why it's catching steam is because, well, you guys know, right? Everybody is coming from the Northeast and the upper Midwest. The crowd now at I-77, right? They're packing the place out. I was telling the gentleman before that when guys like us see crowds on the highway, we say, oh, goody, 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 right? <laughs> Lots of people need places to live and rent to pay. So let's take a look at Houston. Houston's an interesting, and I'm gonna go quickly on this, but Houston, again, blue line is the USA. Houston just didn't even register the housing boom or the housing bust, all right? And then all of a sudden began to take off. Now what's interesting about Houston is that during this period, I think I have a pointer here, yeah, during this period right here, oil prices shot up and they said that Houston was gonna get harmed by that. The new oil prices shot down. Houston was supposed to get harmed by that. Then a hurricane came along. Houston was supposed to get destroyed. The real estate economy of Houston was called down and out several times during this period of time, but it just kept chugging along. And then since then it's taken off. And it's taken off because it, it diversified itself away from the energy industry into a more widespread southern, major southern job attracting market. And again, you look at this, and I look at something like this, and I think that it's probably got to level off, right? Because it's just too steep. It's one of the takeaways. Go to Atlanta. Atlanta, again, boom, bust, recovery, right? A lot of people in Atlanta will look at this and say, we have another, oh, it's supposed to block it. It's not gonna work. They look at that and they worry, 
that we have a bubble coming, but they don't go far enough back. So we found for years that if you, you have to zoom way back to get the trending on this. If you look at this and you say, well, obviously there's a bust coming, but you forget that it actually came from, as you start the beginning of this trend, here's a great little, little uh, trick here. You start at the beginning of the 20 years. You establish your trend line. I'm on the blue line here. You split the peak in the trough and you carry that line forward. That's where it's going. Okay, so we've seen, I'll, I'll do this on every one. We're nationally, we just basically caught up to where the market intended to be all along. Boom, bust, recovery, right on the same line. So that really, really, really long 50-year chart I showed you, that's gonna show this. Ooh, and then back to this again. And that's what's in the process of happening. So Atlanta, if you begin here, split the peak in the trough, carry that forward a little bit high, right? So Atlanta may be headed for, I don't see any reason to see a bust in Atlanta because the population is growing so fast but this should not continue like that, but there's no reason to think it would go down. It should level off. If anybody has any questions on this stuff as we go, please just jump right in. Florida, same idea. Split the peak and trough, carry it forward. This is Tampa, right? Tampa has just caught up to where it was gonna be all along. Here's Phoenix, big party, big hangover. People are talking about a bubble in Phoenix right now, but again, I go back to the same analysis. There's a really unmistakable trend line here in the green. Splits the difference, it's caught right back up again. See, the more of these things you, you, you look at, and if you're like me, you obsess over them, you start to get this unshakable feeling that the resilience of this market, because it is housing in America, population growth equals housing demand, that when it's disrupted by human events like the last 20 years, it just wants to make its way back to the comfortable place that it always wanted to go anyway, no matter where you go. Kansas City, no boom, no bust, right? Pretty much steady. Starting to catch on again here, but the trend line, again, catches it right here. Baltimore, Maryland. People think Baltimore is a bad real estate market. Baltimore turns out is a phenomenal real estate market. All right, Baltimore's headlines make people afraid of it, but Baltimore had a boom, didn't really have much of a hangover, and has hung on to the majority of its values. All right, so there are people who are avoiding investing in Baltimore because they don't know this chart right here. The secret on Baltimore is that Baltimore is a suburb of DC. It's really not its own city. It's part of the ecosystem of the DC metro area, and that's what keeps it elevated. <clears throat> Detroit. Detroit loses the whole manufacturing base. All right, Detroit is down and out. Detroit is corrupt. Detroit's downtown is wrecked, except for the fact that now it's coming back. And this is probably the best deal in America right now. All right, we've got a, a government that is basically you could, if you like the president, you think he's talking them into coming back. If you don't like him, you think he's threatening and muscling them to come back. But the auto companies are, in fact, coming back. And so this trend right here, I believe we're going to see this thing come back up again. All right? Jacksonville, Florida, same idea. All right, so here's what's going to get it, uh, hopefully interesting, is that we try to now, we, we get asked a lot by these large clients, like, okay, so Denver is great, but I missed it, right? Like. I, I wish I bought in Denver back in 2013 or 14, but now it's gone up so strong. I don't know, maybe I missed it, right? So what is like Denver? Now what's interesting about Denver is we still think it's a buy because of the cannabis business, all right? You don't have to love the idea of weed being legalized, but it's a massive industry. And what happened in Colorado is they opened their arms to it. So while a bunch of other states were sort of thinking about it, Denver just said, or Colorado said, yeah, yeah, bring it here. And all this infrastructure is now being built to house the cannabis business, which is people who don't love it think of it as recreational, it's medicinal as the primary. It's gonna be massive recreational also, but the point is, it doesn't matter what you think of it, at the end of the day, a really, really big industry just set up shop in Colorado and Denver is the epicenter of it. But it's a good point that maybe, like I look at this thing and say, what, what is like Denver, but is in Denver? Okay, what has the same fundamentals, but hasn't popped yet? And the answer to that question is Colorado Springs. Look at the green line. Here's Denver, and then takes off. Here's Colorado Springs. Same, green line's the same, until you get right here. And it's only starting to go up right now. So there are tricks to this trade, all right, of finding the places that are reading what's happening today, figuring out why it happened, and then finding another place where it's happening next and then buying there. Does that make sense? 
You guys know Ted Turner? Billionaire from Atlanta, right? I think he, he owns CNN, he owns a lot of other businesses. Um, interesting character. His dad bought real estate along the, uh, the stretch where they were planning to build the interstate highway system. That's how his family got wealthy, is they said, okay, they're gonna build this interstate highway system, and instead of just watching it happen, he bought real estate where the highway was going, and then he put up billboards, all right? Not, not a hugely accurate analogy to my point, except for the core point, which is where you see progress heading if you get out ahead of it. I don't see Colorado Springs as being a big risk, but I find it so fascinating that this part of the chart, the green, looks almost the same. Like it, the other ones are jumping around, making it hard to see but the green looks almost exactly the same until the launch point, which I think is happening in Colorado Springs right now. All right, so what's the next Nashville? Same thing, look at Nashville. Like a ski ramp, all right? What's like Nashville? How about Chattanooga? Same chart, except for Chattanooga's just starting to happen now. All right, so Chattanooga's the new Nashville. All right, I told you Houston before. Here's another one of these charts taking off. What's like Houston? How about Pittsburgh? Pittsburgh? Pittsburgh is shell fracking. Houston's a big oil industry, energy industry city. And so is Pittsburgh now because they're digging. And again, you don't have to love the environmental impact of fracking to recognize the fact that that's an industry that set up shop over here. But these charts look uncannily similar, except for one of them is only beginning to take off now. That makes sense? Uh, what else do I got here? Dallas, Oklahoma City, same chart. We actually have an event coming up in Oklahoma City now because Oklahoma City is the new Dallas. It's beginning to take off just like Dallas did. It's almost about to. All right, so I wanna talk about Charlotte then now. So coming back around again, there are probably a half a dozen to a dozen cities that are as good as Charlotte as an investment market, but there's none that are actually better in our opinion, okay? This is one of the core places where no matter what you look at, You've got inbound migration coming from all the high population density, cold, expensive cities, Boston, New York, DC, Chicago, Detroit, the whole upper Midwest, all of Ohio, making its way down to Charlotte. You see it, right? Everybody you meet has an accent like mine, right? Um, <clears throat> so what we're trying to do now is figure out, the, the concept is find a region of the country that's working, then find the metro area in the country that's, that, that's working in that region, and then within the metro area, find the pockets that are starting to pop. And one of my favorite ways of forecasting where the market's going is looking at the population centers as they grow and then figuring out where the opportunity is gonna be. So here's 1940. You can't see this that well, but here's Charlotte. Okay, here's Mooresville. Here's uh, Weddington and Waxhaw and that stuff. Here's Gastonia, here's Concord. So you get the feel for it? Looks like a big nasty weather map, but here's what I wanna show you, 1940. The dark spots are high density population, and then as it goes to green and yellow, it gets looser and looser. So nobody lives here, some people live here, and a lot of people live here. 1940, there's 1950, 60, 70, 80, 90, 2000, 2010, and today. And the forecast is 2030, 2040, 2050. So if you think that it's going to get looser around here, I think you're all wet. <laughs> It's only gonna get tighter. But the point is, I gotta go back here. Here's 2000, 2000, 2020. A lot of us can look at Mooresville, barely on the map, all of a sudden starting to get cranking and it's forecasted to go heavy from there. Gastonia is a really interesting trajectory here because if you look at the directions, we understand the lake is the pull north. And then we understand that Concord and Kannapolis is to pull that direction, Gastonia is to pull this direction, and then all this stuff to the south is just like it's all spread across this, all right? But again, going back all the way to 1940, you can't miss where these places are growing. So the question is, where are our picks in Charlotte where the markets are going now? I'll tell you what my personal one is. I'm, I just bought two houses last week, okay? And I'm gonna share with you my own personal thesis, even though I know I'm gonna regret it, because I'm gonna see one of you guys at an open house at some point and say, oh, he's gonna outbid me, he's gonna outbid me. But I wanna tell you anyway, because it just illustrates the point, and again, our hope here is that if you like this and you wanna start to make plans to build a real estate portfolio, that you see that we've got our heads on straight, we have a lot of data to work with, we have a, a methodology of picking these winners, 
Um, and, uh, and we've got all the pieces in place to help you do it. So what I really dig about, actually, let me go to this next thing. I'm going to jump right to this. So the transit plan, transit planning, highway expansions, train stations, bus depots, all that stuff is all based upon research and studies that go way beyond what I've been doing here, but it's the same basic idea. Where are the people going to need to get into the city from? Where's the population going to be? So we don't have what sometimes happens, which is overcrowding in schools, overcrowding on roads. How do, how do the city planners get out ahead of that? Um, and then where do they build the transit? So you probably have heard about the, um, the light rail coming north, right? If you've read about it or heard about it, here's the latest as of January of this year. This is Mooresville, this is downtown Charlotte, and it is recommended at this stage that they build a train, a light rail train that's gonna basically make its way up all the way to Mount Morn, which is a mile or two this direction, okay? Now, some people have already figured this out because you can see a whole bunch of apartment complexes going in right near where that train station is going to be. This is the north trajectory. This is the south, I'm sorry, the east-west trajectory. So here's downtown Charlotte, all the way down here to Matthews, all the way out here to Belmont, and then a dotted line going out to Gastonia. This stretch right here going to Belmont has been approved. All right, so this is where I get excited. Here's the airport. You know what's being built right next to the airport? 2,500 job, Amazon distribution center, okay? If you drive by it, if you go by the intersection of 485 and 85, you're gonna see a thing that looks like a mall. And it's not a mall, but it kinda is a mall. You just can't go inside. It's got everything that a mall would normally have except for people. It's got the bots that bring it out and drop it in the basket and deliver it to your house. It is a mall, but customers don't go in, they deliver it to your house. That's Amazon's distribution facility. 2,500 jobs going right here, okay? Train stations going right here, 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 and here, and then one in Belmont. Every place along, every place you see a dot, property values within walking distance of that dot are going to double in the next 10 years, maybe five, all right? My belief, I just bought two houses at about $200,000 a piece in Belmont, walkable to the train, both can be worth 300 grand the day that train station opens. All right, that's the kind of thinking that I want you thinking about. So Charlotte is a winner. Anything in Charlotte, basically, if you're buying a decent neighborhood, or, you know, it's going to be a winner. Don't buy the worst house you can find. Buy the best house you can find in the neighborhood that you choose, right? But then when you can find the places where the property values are necessarily going to go up because the demand is going to get higher. One of the houses I bought, the listing agent, very nice gal, I asked her, so what's the buzz about the train station? She goes, well, nobody cares about that yet because it's not going to be open for three years. Perfect, right? Her customers are buying homes to live in them. So they don't care about the train station now because they're not gonna use the train station now. I'm perfectly happy to buy it. I, I waited until the train station got approved before I invested because I didn't want to, I didn't want to find out they didn't approve it. Like I was, I probably could have gotten a better deal a month earlier. But I waited until it got approved so I knew that was gonna happen. There's still a chance it won't because things can change. But I'm pretty sure it's going to. But the fact that my competition who are buying houses, don't, most of them are home buyers and they don't think this is relevant to them yet, means that I'm still getting pre-train station prices. And that exists everywhere you see a dot right here. Pre-train station pricing in a place where the commute from here to here is gonna be like 13 minutes and there's no traffic on these train tracks right here. Right? Is that making sense? So check this out now. I decided to try to, this is 2030, again, Charlotte, Gastonia, Mooresville, Concord. And then here is the transit plans. I'm going to try to just bring them through. So you can see the dark circles are where they're saying in 10 years the population is going to be booming. And you can see that they're bringing the transit to those places. Right? So our core advice is to pay attention to where these circles are getting darker and just buy there. Right? It's not rocket science. Population growth equals housing demand equals upward pressure on prices and rents. All right? And so the last thing I want to tell you about is, so our company has access to every property for sale in the country and in Charlotte. So any house you see for sale anywhere, we can dem show you and analyze it for you and help you figure out what the yield. Take a moment to say that because I know we got some new people in here. Yield is how much profit you make on the property. All right, so you charge rent, you pay your taxes, you pay your insurance, 
you pay your maintenance and your property management. What you have left is your cash flow, and that is when you compare it to how much money you paid for the property is your yield. So if I pay 200 grand for a house and I'm gonna get $12,000 in profit a year, I got a 6% yield. 6% of $200,000 is 12 grand. That's what that investment's gonna do. But that $200,000 house is gonna be worth 205, 210, 220, hopefully 275, 300 when the train station opens up. So that's my appreciation. So the combination of yields, my income every month, and the appreciation, the value of the property getting greater, the combination of those two things is the return on investment, the ROI. And what we found, no matter where you go across the country, is you wind up at about a nine. A house in America is about a nine when you add together the yield and the price appreciation. Now here, it's a five or a six plus a three or a four. Five or six percent yield, three or four percent appreciation gets you a nine to nine and a half in Charlotte. You go to Raleigh, it's a four and a five. Four percent yield, five percent appreciation. Same thing in Austin. Dallas is like Charlotte. Raleigh and Austin are kind of the same. Right? You go to Cincinnati, Ohio, it's an eight and a one. Right? These two things wind up balancing themselves out. The house is getting more valuable. If that's quieter, the yields tend to go up because the rents go up faster than the houses appreciate. So the yield is higher, the appreciation is lower. That's why Detroit is so good because Detroit's yields are like 11% and there's been no appreciation, but we think it's gonna come now. So you might get four or 5% appreciation in Detroit on top of 11% yield and be at 15 or 16, but I digress. These dots represent subdivisions by Lennar. Lennar is one of the biggest home builders in the country. Um, they're a client of ours. The reason we're talking about them is that even though we can sell you any house for sale in Charlotte, we're highlighting these because they're brand new. And this is becoming one of the biggest trends. Actually, there's a professional investor conference that we went to last month that happens every six months. It's for those big Wall Street clients that we've been working with for 10 years. And the big buzz at that conference, correct, was build to rent, okay? The biggest investors in the country who bought beautiful houses, new ones, old ones, junky ones to fix them up, they did everything under the sun. They all figured out, now that they've had a chance to season their portfolios for five or six or seven years, they've all figured out the highest quality house you can afford and the best condition you can afford. That's what they've all decided to do. That's always been my style anyway. And the reason is that I can't fix anything. I mean, if, if I tried to fix my own bathroom, forget about me fixing it. Can I tell? <laughs> yeah, I had to tell it. So the, the, these hands are so soft <laughs> that when I hold the baby, I get chafed. Not the baby. That's how soft they are. So I'm not swinging a hammer. I don't know these things. I can't handle them. I can't, I can't even manage a contractor. So what do I do? I pick the winning place and I buy the nicest house that I can in that place. The nicest house really is going to be a brand new house for the most part. And so Lennar has given us access. You have on your tables a list of properties that are for sale right now. Um, I've actually got, I can give you a bounce around a bit, but these, I gotta go back to the different trajectories around Charlotte where that train station thing is going. I wanted to show you one sampling of product that's available right now that has some benefit, i.e. it's new, no one's lived there, it requires no, nothing to fix because it's brand new, the systems are under a warranty, and you will rent a house out that's brand new, like overnight, and there'll be competition for it. You can get 50 to $100 more in rent on a house that's brand new, just because there's three people that want it, because they all, everybody wants brand new. So this thing spreads out across all these different markets where we think it's very hot in Charlotte. And what I wanna show you is just a quick little sampling of those subdivisions as seen through renterswarehouse.com, right? This is just a quick little demo of, not demo, but an illustration of our technology so that you know that you could use this for free, okay? So this is one of those portfolios, um, one of those subdivisions in David Davidson on the map right there. And as you scroll down, you'll see the models of the houses and you can bounce into each one of them and they have the interactive calculators you can start to use to test your assumptions on yield, okay, on ROI. You can see the price appreciation projections. You can change assumptions on here and see how that changes the way the charts play out. All right, it basically, it's designed to be a website that is what, it's what E-Trade is for stocks, but for real estate instead. So the idea of you being able to analyze any property you see, you can open a free account on the site, add any property that you own in there, 
to get an evaluation of your properties and any property you're thinking about buying in there in your own private account. Build your own fantasy portfolio in there to see how your different, you know, the things you're thinking about doing, how they blend together and mix together to create an outcome 10, 20, 30 years out. All right, that's what we built here. This is the kind of stuff, the kind of technology that we built for those big Wall Street firms and then decided to make available to everybody. So again, financial reports, market data, here's that price performance chart, population trends, migration patterns, unemployment data, job diversity data, all this stuff is right here. Okay, that's the first one. The second one is up north um, in Troutman. Okay, the prices are a bit lower. The house is again brand new. This thing is yielding closer to six and six and a half percent. So you get a little further outside the city center, the prices get a little bit lower and, uh, and you see a higher yield. So you can play around. These are all, if you go to renderswarehouse.com, you search for properties for sale in Charlotte, you'll find all these in here. And anybody here from our team, this is Adam, um, they can explain these things to you. And what do we got here? Here's the one that's south of the city. All right, again, same idea, same builder, a lot of the same models and same tech. And the fourth one is uh, over in Denver on the western side of the lake. Again, same idea, mid fives on the yield on those. Yes? Not necessarily equate to high renter demand. Like if you're saying it's renter yields, but it's a guarantee they're going to rent for that? No. It's just for your projecting that. Uh, yeah, the question is, are we guaranteeing these rents? No, we project them, so that's what we do, all right? So when you see the, the yields on this, when you come in, sit down with us, start taking a closer look, we would show you the comps of why we think it's going to rent for that number and how that all plays out, yeah. all right? So we think we're accurate on those things, but they're not rented today, so um, that has to happen after the fact. And uh, by the way, so uh, Lenar actually gave us about 60 properties. We're down to about 17 or 18 right now in total, so people have bought total like 35 properties in the last three weeks in these various communities. It's obviously high demand for home buyers in the area. And it goes to the reason that if you are buying a house to live there, generally people like to rent those places as well. And we come up with the rents by essentially doing what Greg said, just comping out what other people pay for rents in those areas. So we can yeah. reasonably expect them to rent out for that Yeah, amount. I figure that's how you get the rental projection cost. I'm just curious about the home demand versus the buying. Right. One of the cool things, like we were just we were showing Denver, one of the neat things about the western side of this lake is that they're looking at the eastern side and saying, we don't want that to happen here. Meaning, they see 500 unit apartment complexes popping up like dandelions in Mooresville and Huntersville and Davidson and Cornelius. And they have been doing things like putting temporary moratoriums on uh, approvals for multifamily. And so what they're doing is, they're, it's, not, it's not forever, but there's a political movement on that side of the lake to constrain supply. I've been talking about demand the whole time today, right? But it's all a supply demand equation. The demand for housing in America is insatiable, all right? If you can find the places where it's gonna be hotter than others, you're gonna wind up doing better. But if you can find a place where the demand is hot, but the supply is also lighter, like I'm not buying in Mooresville right now. I live here, but I'm not buying here because there's too many apartment complexes going up and that's all competition for me. I'd rather be down in Belmont by the train station where there's not that big rush of apartment complexes. I like the western side of the lake because they're trying to develop a little bit slower and not as high density. So these are all things that like, you, it is a, um, it's a game of calculated chances and odds that you're trying to figure out where things are going. Uh, but one of the things I like about this is when we show you 5% yields, it's gonna produce at 5%. Your 5% yields are not high yields. They're just baseline, you know, we don't, we have never been the kind of organization that chases the best deals in town or tries to project things that are higher than they are because there's a lot of people out there that have money sitting in savings accounts, generating zero, okay? Or, you know, just to them, a 5% yield is actually pretty darn good if it's what's considered to be a stable investment, something they feel good about that fits their plan for 20 years. And then of course, if you buy a piece of new construction on the western side of the lake, in theory, that side of the lake is going to become more valuable the same way this side did. And so later on, when you go to take money out, sell it or refinance to pull cash out, you'll be in a great spot because of that demand. Okay. Do you guys market to renters as well? Is that part of the yeah, yeah, yeah. management arm? Yeah, the question is, do we market to renters? Yes. So when, we, when, when a client, if you guys bought houses and you wanted us to manage them for you, we take them over, we advertise them, we market them, put the sign out front, advertise it, it goes on 96 different websites, 
we show the property, we sign the leases, we move the people in, we give them the keys, we do the, the, the inspections on the way in, we then collect the rents, we then pay the expenses, we send you the difference. When they call because something's wrong with the house, they call us, we send the contractor out to fix it. It's, uh, it's pretty hands off. All right, any other questions? All right, thank you, appreciate it.